Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13. A month or so ago on the Monday night discussion group at our home, we had looked at verse 19, and I think I made the statement then someday I'm going to preach a sermon on that. Well, it took me a month, but here it is. Starting with verse 1, 1 through 6, Saul reigned one year. And when he had reigned two more years over Israel, then Saul chose for himself three hundred, excuse me, for himself three thousand from Israel. Two thousand of those were with Saul in Mishmash and in Mount Bethel, and a thousand were with Jonathan at Gibeah and Benjamin. And of the rest of the people he sent each man to his tent. And Jonathan's struck the garrison of the Philistines at Gibeah, and the Philistines heard, and Saul blew the ram's horn throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard, saying, Saul has struck the garrison for the Philistines, and also Israel has made herself stink to the Philistines. And the people are called to Gilgal after Saul. And the Philistines gathered to fight Israel 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people like the sand on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Mishmash and eastward toward Beth Haven. And the men of Israel saw that they were in a tight place, for the people were distressed. And the people hid themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. Dropping down to verse 15. And Samuel arose and went up to Gilgal, from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people present with him at 600 men. Now, just simple math teaches us, tells us, between verse 1 and verse 15, Saul has lost. 80% of his army to desertion. Due to fear, basically. Their only weapons were slings, clubs, and rocks. Verse 19 through 23. And there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines, and each man to sharpen his plowshare, his mattock, his axe, and his coulter. And there was a charge of a pen for sharpening the plowshares, and for the mattocks, and for the three-pronged forks, and for the axes, and, and to sharpen the plowshares. And it happened in the day of the battle there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people with Saul and Jonathan. But Saul, excuse me, but with Saul and with his son Jonathan were found sword and spear. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the passage of Mishmash. Why were they in this situation? In the days of Joshua, when the Israelites were taking over the promised land, they were feared among all the surrounding people. And here we see them, the one that's doing the fear. Joshua 2, 9 through 11, and Rahab is doing the speaking here, and she said to the men, I know that Jehovah has given you the land and that your terror has fallen on us 
and that all those who live in the land faint because of you. For we have heard that Jehovah dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you, and when you came out of Egypt, and that you did it to the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, and whom you utterly destroyed. And we have heard in our hearts, and our hearts melted, nor did any more spirit remain in any man because of you, for Jehovah your God, he is God of heaven and in earth beneath. See, in, in the days of Joshua, God had given the Israelites all the land that was promised them, and they occupied it. They occupied it almost without opposition. And I say it went almost without opposition. The native tribes that were there put up an opposition, but they were so afraid that they would rather run than fight. So when the Hebrews came in, they occupied the land, they occupied houses they didn't build, they occupied cities that were ready to live in, and God gave it to them almost without opposition. When we look at the judges, chapter 1, we see the start of their downfall. Verse 27 starts a list of things that the Israelites did that were not commanded of them. Or they did not do what was commanded of them. Specifically, verse 28, it says, And it came to pass, when Israel was strong, that they put the Canaanites to tribute and did not utterly destroy them, or did not utterly drive them out. Sometimes we get lazy. Sometimes we get to thinking that we have, we know better than God. And they are doing that very same thing. Rather than do what God has told them to do, they decided that, you know, there's a prophet to be made here, and God hasn't allowed us to have that. So if we have them a tribute, in other words, pay us for working, it's called taxes, if they will pay us for working or for allowing them to live here, we can also have them as our slaves and we don't have to do anything but sit back and take it easy. And this is what they did. Judges 2 verse 9, we see that Joshua has died at age 110. Then in verse 11, <coughs> And there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Judges 5 verse 8 says, And they chose new gods. Then war was in the gates. Was there a shield or a spear seen among 40,000 of Israel? It was common practice in that day, still is today, when one country conquers another, the people with skills, the people that lead other people, people that build are removed to the home country to build up that nation. And they will take 
shall we say, the lower <laughs> part of society and move in to fill in that void. Uh, that lower part coming from other uh, places they have captured. So in this homeland that's left, the poorest of the poor is all that's there. Well, this is kind of what the Assyrians did when they conquered. This is what Nebuchadnezzar did when he conquered. Uh, 2 Kings 24, uh, Isaiah 54, Jeremiah 24, all uh, will tell this. This is most likely the situation here. Israel had no blacksmiths. Why? The Philistines were put to slaves. They were taught to be the blacksmiths. And through a few generations, the skill has not been taught to anybody other than the Philistines. Through a few generations, the only blacksmiths around, the only ones that have any skill, the only one that have access to the materials are the Philistines. The Philistines took advantage of this because now they are in charge. They are the ones that have all the armament. So now you see why Israel was running scared, living in the thickets and in the holes and in the grounds. The Israelites have no hope of conquering the Philistines. They have no hope of their God intervening because now they are not worshiping Jehovah, but whatever God is convenient of the people around about them. They had rejected God and chosen other gods, Judges 5.8. They had rejected Jehovah as king and asked for a king like the nations around them. They rejected Jehovah three times. In the second chapter of Judges, we find a statement, and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel and he delivered them into the hands of the Amorites uh, or whatever people was near. Three times in one chapter. We see that while they were faithful and obedient to God, he fought for them. He fought their battles for them. And they were looked up to. They were respected. They were the world power. But when they started to serve other gods, then they became like the countries about them, and God let them or allowed their neighbors to come in and conquer and harass. God allowed the Philistines to remove blacksmiths from Israel and do their own. Why? Sin. Sin. A short three-letter word. The children of Israel had no blacksmiths. They could not make tools for farming. They could not make weapons for their own defense. 
it's not because they didn't have access to the raw materials. Deuteronomy 8 and 9, Deuteronomy 33, 25, both indicate that in the land of Asher was both iron and brass. All they needed to do was to dig it up, smelt it, and make the tools necessary. But they had lost the skill. You see, God allowed this situation to develop as a way of teaching the Israelites to trust in Him and not in their own might and their own power and wisdom. They had turned away from God and wanted to be like the nations about them, but God is teaching them a lesson in trust. In 1 Samuel 14, 1 through 17, we see Jonathan and his armor bearer routing about 3,000 Philistines by themselves. Two men against 3,000. Jonathan makes this statement in verse 6. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or few. We might say, well, you know, that was back in those days. Romans 8.31 tells us, if God is for us, who can be against us? Consider, if you will, Ephesians 6, verse 17. There it tells us that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. You've got a Bible? Can you read? <coughs> Can you talk? If so, then you have the products, the raw products, you have the instructions, and yea, the responsibility to make the tools needed. You see, if you've got God's Word and the ability who spread that word, you just became God's blacksmith. We have the ability to use the sword of the Spirit, and that makes us blacksmiths. And blacksmiths are wanting in the Lord's church, just as they were with the Lord's people back in Samuel's day. Proverbs 29, 18 states, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, no preacher to expound the law, the word of the Lord is scarce, so people perish. Where there is no vision, people rebel, not just against God, but against their own leaders, They're against good preaching. They make, they don't make sense. When they don't have leadership, when they don't have vision, people become idle. What happens to a bunch of school kids when the teacher isn't there? 
Do you ever see school kids, when the teacher is out of the room, sitting quiet, studying? If the teacher's not there, they play. And the world about us is much the same way. When we lose sight of what God is wanting us to do, we play and do what we want to do. When there is no vision, the people are scattered from God, from their duty from, by apostasies. They're scattered from one another by division, man-made ideas. The people perish because there's no smiths in Israel. And I'm speaking of spiritual Israel, the church. Hosea 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. that thou shalt not be no priest to me. Seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. We've already seen that the <coughs> Israelites had gotten into the fix that they were in because they had rejected God and forgotten the law. Hosea here is telling the Jews, and it's about 500 years later, but the same situation is basically on them. And he's telling them, you know, the same thing's going to happen. Here we are 2,500 years later than Hosea. Can it happen to us today? You better believe it. The people were destroyed because there was no smiths in Israel. No one speaking to the people for God or about God. They were rejecting God. And because of this, God was rejecting them. <clears throat> Amos 8, 11 and 12. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor of thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from north even the east, and they shall run to and fro and seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. This was written to Judah. after the northern kingdom had been taken captive by the Assyrians. Judah was warned that they were about to be given to Nebuchadnezzar as punishment for their unfaithfulness. Why? Sin. There's no smiths in Israel. The people were starving from lack of knowledge of God. The people were speaking to the people for God and about God. You know, no one was doing this. There was a famine of knowledge. When God's priests don't do their job, who will? And brethren, you and I are God's fruit. All of this sounds very similar to what I see going on in the world today. There's a famine in the land, a shortage of knowledge of Christ, a shortage of obedience to Him, rejecting His teaching. We've even gone to 
same-sex marriage now. We've been aborting children for a long, long time. We've been putting our thoughts ahead of God's thoughts, our desires ahead of His. We see people going north and south and east and west and seeking new revelations. Why do they want new ones? Because they don't like the old ones. They go trying to entice humanity into their folds, appealing to the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. They claim to be seeking God's way, and yet everyone is doing that which is right in his own eyes. The same problem that we read about back in Judges. Matthew 15, 7 through 9. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah the prophet say of you, say, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. This prophecy is found in Isaiah 29, 13. We talked about prophecies in Bible class this morning. This one, Matthew repeats from Isaiah about 400 years previous. It's also repeated by Mark Mark 7, 6 and 7. It tells us that the teaching, teachings of men are vain, useless, of no value in getting to heaven. The only word of God, only the word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, has that power. In Revelation 6, 15 through 17, we see what will happen to those who teach these false doctrines. And also those that pay heed to those doctrines. Not just the teacher, but the listener as well. Revelation 6, 15 through 17 reads, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bound man, and even every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Brethren, God's chosen people today is not Israel in the flesh, the Jewish people. God's chosen people today is spiritual Israel, the church. In Romans 9, 6 through 8, but it is not that the word of God had no effect. For they were not all Israel who are of Israel. Nor all are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac shall your seed be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh are not the children of God but the children of the promise are counted as seeds. 
So we see that it's not the physical descendants of Abraham that are God's chosen, but it's those who are obedient to God as Abraham was. The spiritual house of Israel. What do you know about Abraham? In Genesis 12 and following, we see that wherever Abraham went, he built an altar and worshiped God. In Genesis 12, verse 1, we see that promise given to Abraham. Go forth out of thy country and from thy kindred and out of thy father's house and come to a land which I shall show thee. Hebrews 11, 8. It says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called, went unto a place where he should after receive for an inheritance. He obeyed, not knowing whither he went. Abraham's faith was such that when God told him to go, he picked up and started and didn't know where he was going. But he trusted the one who told him to go, and that was enough. That's the kind of faith that builds the nation. God. How many faithful, excuse me, Abraham, we find talking to God. In fact, he's bargaining with God on how many faithful. Uh, can be found in Sodom and Gomorrah before God destroys. He talked to God face to face. And uh, Moses is the only other person we ever see a record of doing the same thing. Speaking to God as friend to friend. Exodus 33, 11, we see the same said of Moses that we did of Abraham. Can we say that very same thing about our relationship to God? Do we, on a daily best basis, pray to God? Have we ever hesitated to speak of our relationship to Christ? Or have we failed to do it because we were afraid of what the people around us might think or say? Have we failed to speak up when we should have defended the faith? I hate to say it, but in the times past, I have failed that. And I think in some times that we all, I don't think I'm unique in that. I think we all have done so. <clears throat> Is it because we don't know what to say? Were we afraid of what the people around us would think? Matthew 10, 28 tells us to fear not them that kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Who should we fear, man or God? One can harm only the physical body, this temporal thing. The other 
can both kill both body and soul and that lasts for an eternity. Brethren, Jehovah was trying to teach the Israelites to trust in him and not in their own armor, not in their horses and their chariots, but to trust in him for protection, not in their own strength. That same trust is necessary today. Matthew 6 has a long <coughs> list of things that men have a desire for and trust in. The discussion, though, ends in verses 33 and forward <laughs> with the statement, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought of itself. Sufficient unto the day is evil thereof. So we come to the end of this lesson and we come to some questions. How strong is our faith? Are we willing to trust God for our safety, for our food, for our care? Are we ready to take his word, the, the sword of the spirit, to our neighbors? Have we failed to study his word and become the blacksmith that we need to be? I've known a few blacksmiths and real blacksmiths. I've never seen one that was not dirty, sweaty, because of his work. If we sit back and we want to stay clean, we're not blacksmiths. We've got to dig into that word we've got to study and not just stop there but we need to take it to our neighbor the past is history what we've done even yesterday is gone but we can change the future if we continue as we have been doing what what's the term I've heard stupidity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. If we continue doing as we've been doing, we will be conquered by Satan and spend eternity in hell. We can have eternity in heaven with Christ if we repent and devote our lives to him. Study his word. Teach to others. Then there will be smiths <coughs> in church. Then there will be smiths in Israel. If we can help you in any way, the baptistry is ready. If you have not put on Christ in baptism, any other way that we might help you, let me know as we stand.